first and 10 on their first possession. Daniels with a toss pitch in the backfield, and Tyreek Jones was there before the ball was. It's going to be a loss of five. Well, behind yet another dominant effort by the defense, Boise State rolls into Colorado Springs on Saturday and picks up their third straight victory. Genty and Green in the backfield. Air Force with a four-man front. Green to throw it. Dumps it out of the backfield to Genty. Caught it at the 35 to the 40. Down the sidelines on the left side to the 40 to the 30. He'll get inside the 25-yard line. That little screen pass goes for 42 yards. With starter George Halani out, true freshman Ashton Genty totaled up 95 yards in the first half alone. But the real savior of the offense, junior kicker Jonah Dalmas. He went four for four in the afternoon, including a career-long tying 51-yarder. Nice snap, nice hold. Dalmas' kick is up, and Dalmas' kick is good. 51 yards for Jonah Dalmas. His third field goal of the game, and Boise State stretches the lead out to 16 to nothing. Welcome once again into Jay Sports Bar. Jay Tuss alongside one of the all-time greats to ever play over at Boise State, Shane Williams Rhodes. Boise State goes out on the road and picks up a victory over Air Force. The final score, 19 to 14, and uh, once again, Boise State rides another strong defensive effort across the finish line. Yeah, this was a game where we talked about last week that it was going to come down to if our defense was more was disciplined enough mm -hmm. to stop these guys. Um, I know some people asked on Twitter who to look out for this last week, and I said that the DBs would have to be heavily involved in the run game in order for us to be successful. And if you watch the first half of that game, your safeties were making almost every play. Mm -hmm. Whether it was forcing the quarterback to pitch, whether it was taking the quarterback, it was great. And that's why at the beginning of the game you saw turnovers and things like that happen early because those guys were downhill. Yeah. And coming. Tyreek Jones living up around the line of scrimmage, too, from his nickel position. Coming up on the show today, we're going to talk about uh, Taylor Green's development. Is Jonah Dalmas the best kicker in school history? How badly does Boise State need either running back George Halani or Ashton Genty moving forward? But first, we begin with how good is this defense? Because you look at the numbers, Shane, and this group of guys, historically good. You just mentioned that... It, it was going to be a, it was a matter of discipline when facing Air Force. And 1 through 11, that unit was just so connected against the Falcons. Air Force only rushed for 175 yards. And it's so funny because you would say only 175 yards against almost any opponent, and that would be alarming. Against Air Force, that's less than half of their season average. It was one of the best performances against the Air Force ground game of the Troy Calhoun era. So um, what did you see? out of that group of guys in Colorado Springs on Saturday? You know, I think the biggest thing that I saw was when it came to the option, I felt like guys did their job because usually when you see that, guys get kind of flustered because they see, okay, he can pitch it, he can hold it. And the guy who's supposed to have the quarterback, they typically don't take the quarterback. They overplay the quarterback so that they can make the tackle on the pitch man. But these guys were actually going for the quarterback, forcing him to – pitch it so the quarterback couldn't just vertically cut on those guys. Mm -hmm. And then you saw, because they were being so disciplined, like I said, being a game, uh, Tariq Jones, he literally played the, he went to the quarterback, and I think the quarterback wasn't expecting him to actually be responsible and yeah. for his guy. And it forced the quarterback to kind of have to hurry up and get the ball out, and he did, and I don't even think he looked at the pitch when he did it. He just tried to get the ball out of his hand, caused a fumble, we get it back. And then, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of good things happening. It, it's so funny because sometimes they make going against their triple option so tough. But on Saturday, they made it seem so gosh darn simple. And we mentioned the fact that this defense right now is loaded with experience. I mean, uh, Tyreek Jones is a six-year player. Ezekiel Noe is a six-year player. Um, Caleb Biggers back for a sixth year. You have uh, George Tarlis in for a sixth year. So um, why do you think that this group of guys just, just gets it? I mean, you even look at a guy like Scott Matlock. I mean, that guy has NFL potential through the roof, mm -hmm. and yet he's not out there trying to pad his stats or do things that would help him as an individual. He just kind of does his job, which in his case a lot of, time does, a lot of times doesn't even mean accumulating stats. But why does this group of guys, do you think, why do they get it? And, and is it sustainable for a full season? Uh, it is, but it is because of the reasons you said. All these guys are old. They're older guys. They've seen this before. They played Air Force and seen Air Force, you know, be able to hit some plays. Mm -hmm. and, uh, if I know Avalos, he hammered on it all week that, all right, guys, now watch this play. 
this safety is supposed to take pitch man. This, safety, this guy is supposed to take the quarterback. This guy actually tries to go make a play on this guy. He misses his assignment. Quarterback goes for 30 yards. Like, they saw that all week. So these guys actually came in and just did what they were supposed to do. We just never seen – when you're so athletic and you can make plays, you want to go make the play rather than do your job. So I think he did a great job of keeping these guys disciplined last week. Man, um, like I said, one of the best defensive efforts – against the Falcons in the Troy Calhoun era. And that's really no joke. In, in the Troy Calhoun era, he's coached 194 games at, at Air Force. Mm -hmm. In 153 of those, the Falcons have had 50 or more carries, right? Mm -hmm. That was the eighth fewest rushing yards they've had in those 153 games. I mean, that, that makes it a top 5% defensive yeah. effort against, against Air Force. So an incredible effort by those guys. And, you know, I, I brought up – um, Scott Matlock's effort because, you know, you look at his stats so often and I really don't think that this is a guy that, like, his stats don't define, like, what he means to this defense. And I want to spend a moment talking about him because if you watch the broadcast, you notice a number of times during the game he would almost stand up like, like a bear at the line of scrimmage, like right before the snap or he would see something and he, and he would do that. And I, I, maybe it's pointing at the sky, I think, because he's maybe trying to communicate with the guys behind him. He is seeing something that is saying, hey, this is a likely pass play out of a, out of a team that doesn't pass that often. Yep. Is that unique out of a defensive lineman, especially a guy on the, in, the, in the interior of a line, to be so well connected and know what's going on on defense that, that he can do that? No, but that comes back to your point, having all of these mature guys who have been in the program for so long, they've seen things a long time. Uh, that, that, that COVID year has been a huge part. It's so weird. It finally caught up, and now yeah. it's a big beneficiary of Boise Being State. able to come back and, yep. you know, be, mature, be a little bit more mature, a little bit more focused, a little bit more dialed in. You've seen things now for five times against mm -hmm. certain opponents. Uh, I think that's playing a major role right now. And you said that it doesn't show up on the stat sheet, but his presence is a lot kind of how Micah Parsons' presence is for the Cowboys. Okay, then we know he's, on this. <laughs> we know he's one of the best, better players on yeah. that line. So if you ever watch the Cowboys play, Micah Parsons is usually going to have taken on a double team. Mm -hmm. Also going to probably have the back coming to chip him out of the backfield. Yep. So he's bringing a lot of tension off of other guys so other guys can make plays, which is why our linebackers and safeties and other guys are able to go in and get one-on-one -on -one matchups. And I'm not really so sure if, it, if it, it's just coincidental, but you do look at a guy like Dimitri Washington who plays oftentimes, he lines up right next to Scott oftentimes, and all of a sudden his production is really starting to increase. Against Air Force, he had two sacks. Uh, he's now... His, his, not just his numbers, but his playmaking numbers are starting to, to increase. And I can only imagine that that is a direct result of, of lining up next to a guy like Scott Matlock at times. So it's, it's cool to see where this defense is going. Another thing about this defense, and I asked Andy Avalos, as well as defensive coordinator Spencer Danielson this week, they have been impeccable at tackling. And I just wanted to figure out this year why they have been so much better this year than they were maybe the last couple of years. Take a listen. Yeah, it definitely is something we emphasize a ton, Jay. The four emphasis we talk about with our team, first and foremost, is communication, eye control. The second one's pursuit. The third one's tackling. And the fourth is takeaway. So not to preach it, you guys, we can get to defense later, but obviously it's a tackle game. And so we're always looking at different ways to drill something that is related to the tackles we're getting. Um, and we have circuits um, set up for these. And Coach Av, Coach Ione, um, you know, our D staff, we look at these things to see wh where are we missing tackles? Where are some things maybe that a tackle show up? And they're also trying to keep it new and fresh for our guys. That's something that I think we've done a good job is it's not, all right, here we go, tackling circuit again, the same drill we've been doing since August, whatever time we started fall camp, to where you're always putting guys in different situations. And we emphasize a ton of practice. Regardless of the tempo, there is a way to finish on the ball carrier um, that we emphasize in a major way. Once again, there's some really good looks at it on Saturday, there's some that we can be better. And we use the exact same clips when we come in here as a defense and I show them, hey guys, this is a good tackle. This is where your eyes should be. This is your pad level. You're, you're going right through the thigh boards. Perfect. This is one that we got to grow in. And then we're going to work it in the drills that week. But at the end of the day, getting the ball and making the tackle when you get there and being violent, that's, that's playing really good defense if you can get that done consistently. Um, and so we're just, it's, it's a huge emphasis for us. We're always looking at ways to drill it better. There's drills we like, then you do those two or three weeks in a row, you're like, hey, we got to find some little tweak to keep our guys, um, 
you know, off a little bit to where they got to react to it. And so trying to always find those things. I mean, the thing that strikes me about that is everything seems intentional, Shane. So you, you hear Spencer Danielson say, like, okay, they see, like, the type of tackles they were good at in a game. And then they see the type of tackling that they might not have been so good at in a game. And then they find this way to quickly um, simulate it in practice so that you work on the bad parts of tackling. Okay. How much with tackling does it help when, when you do keep it fresh, when it's not mon mundane? Because we know as, as well as anybody, you were incredibly elusive during your career. Mm -hmm. So – how would you set up guys to miss, and what frustrated you when they finally could get you to the ground? What, what would they have to do to be successful? Um, I think, well, just piggybacking off that a little bit, Avos is a really a guy that's really big on individuals, so mm -hmm. like doing individual drills and working on things like that, mm -hmm. so tackling circuits and those kind of things and technique. And so I, what I believe is happening is it's not like, at the beginning of the year, you work on tackling, and then as you get to as you go throughout the year, you kind of start doing less tackling drills and more of okay game planning stuff. Yeah, it seems like they took you know the week off and they were still focusing on things yeah. like that because obviously that's going to play a huge role when you have a run team coming to town. Yeah, and so I think that's something they probably are working on a lot, and then it just keeps seeming to coming back. It's like we're going in a circle, but you know if I've played six years and I've seen you know how guys, what guys like to do to set me up to, to, in order to get by me, you know, repetition tells me I need to play inside out, the sideline's my friend. Mm -hmm. If I miss the tackle, you know, nor where my help is. So uh, I think because these guys understand what we're trying to do on defense, um, if you are the guy that's supposed to run the alley, then you know you're, you're obviously, you're there. If you're the corner, you know you're supposed to go outside in and force everything back in, don't allow them to get to the sideline. Mm -hmm. And I think these guys are doing it. I've seen it a ton of times in the game where our corners were coming up they were doing that option, and they were just going straight outside. They weren't going in to make a play, which a lot of people say, why don't you just run inside? Well, now if I'm the corner and I just run inside to go make a play on this option. You don't get that. And I don't get there, and this guy <laughs> sets me up and he bounces it. Now yeah. the receiver who's out here will seal me, and they're going down the sideline. Mm -hmm. These guys aren't doing that. They're doing their jobs. They're going outside in, forcing it to go vertical. Now you got the whole flow coming that way, and they're just getting cleaned up. That, I mean, and that's what stands out to me about this defense, because you look at right now, um, and I, we mentioned this last week on, on this show, they are no, they're the number one team in the country at limiting explosive plays on, on, um, on defense right now, right? Mm -hmm. like, and nobody's even close. They have given up fewer plays of 10 or more yards than any team in the country right now. And, and that's what I think is kind of the cool thing about this defense, is that um, they're disciplined, you might get a yard because of the approach that you just mm -hmm. said, right? Yep. But Boise State is banking on the fact that they're not going to allow explosive plays yeah. and that they, they think it's going to be really hard for you to put together 10 successful offensive plays to the point mm -hmm. where you can go down and get in scoring position. And, and that, it's proven time and time again. That's why Boise State has gotten off the field. Opponents are – they're not getting explosive plays. They're usually behind the chains on third down. Mm -hmm. And that's a big reason why Boise State has allowed the fewest first downs of any defense in the country. So it's just cool to see it kind of connect like this. And I know Spencer Danielson, like, he gives us – you know, he's, he's out there saying, like, no, we could be even better. We can be even better. Um, I, I'm not worried about stopping Colorado State. So I can personally say I don't know how it gets any better than this because they've been incredible. You look at some of these other stats um, – Opposing quarterbacks have completed 48.6% of their passes against Boise State. That's the second worst by an, oppose, by, a, by an opponent in the country. I mean, Boise State's just ridiculous in those regards. They've only allowed five passing touchdowns, the fifth fewest in all of college football. Uh, opposing quarterbacks' efficiency rating, barely over 100. I mean, yeah. by every metric, it's, it's just been absolutely insane by this defense, and it's kind of exciting because they are at this – this pace that they could be historic. The only, they've allowed 140 yards per game so far this year. That's third in the country. That would be by far the second best season in school history. The first was back in 1969, which I would have to ask um, our historian Tom Scott what even happened that season because that was a different era, different year, yeah. different level of football. I don't know if it counts in this regards. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool to see. Do you think – I mean, you've been, you've been a part – of the Boise State program since 2012, whether it be playing mm -hmm. or your, your post career, mm -hmm. best defense you've seen so far. I will I mean, say we, we'll make sure Kamale Correa doesn't come after you. I will from say the 14 best team. defense. I I could debatable. Mm -hmm. I say let me, it's let a me top add, two let, defense since 2012. Let, let me add this: one through 11 on the field. Like I like I mean like, I don't know if they have a Kamale Correa right now. In all honesty, but like. Mm -hmm. One through 11 on the field as a unit, what would you say? 
Still, still just top two? In the last 10 years, I'd say top two. Who, sure. who's, who's, who else is in the there? The other one I would say probably might be 12 or 14. 12 had a stout defense. 12. Mike Atkinson, Jamar Taylor. Yeah. And the thing that was cool about J.C. Percy, right? Mm -hmm. the thing that, that, Tommy Smith. The thing that was cool about that defense is that it didn't have a ton of those, like, household names mm -hmm. on there. But, man, did they play well together. Yeah. Oh, like, Jarrell. Yeah, had, we had all miss Jarrell Gavins. <laughs> we had some guys on that. That that 12 or 14 team, mm -hmm. those, both of those two had guys. But I guess either way to say this is that that is yeah. an awesome – you know, those are awesome teams to be associated with because those teams were also historically good. Um, as it comes to winning this football game or as it came to winning this football game in, in Colorado Springs, I don't think Boise State wins that game without Jonah Dalmas. Yeah, for sure. I mean, four for four on field goal attempts. He connected from 29, 39, 42, and 51. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say this, at the, at the end of that game, if he misses from 51 or any of those other field goals, mm -hmm. all of a sudden Air Force is just going down to kick a field goal to win that, which drastically changes things. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what, did he have 13 points? 13 points if you count the PAT, yes. Yeah, he had 13 points. I mean, that's obviously enough for us to lose the game. Mm -hmm. Just him not making a few kicks. So mm -hmm. It was big. He played a huge role. Uh, obviously, we could see that in the first half when we have got our guys in, we can drive it down and we can get into the red zone. We were just struggling to put it in. Yeah. We were a little bit conservative, you know, so it's kind of you got to play both ends. You be conservative and get points, mm -hmm. or do you be aggressive and, you know, risk turnovers? And so we went that way. It worked out. Uh, not knowing that we would not have our both of our backs in the second half. Yeah. So that was huge, but I think what they I think the way they played it was smart. You bring up Boy State's conservative approach in the red zone. I'm going to get back to that in just a second because I, I want to hang on Jonah Dalmas. Um, when it comes to his active career FBS ranks, first in field goals made per game, just under two per game for his career, which seems crazy. His career field goal percentage, 90.4, second among active players. Um, that He would shatter the school record at this point if he can keep that up. Points per game, 8.8 .8 points per game, third amongst active players. And like I said, that's not kickers. Mm -hmm. That is amongst all active players in college football that qualify for that stat. So running backs, everybody else in there. Uh, not necessarily quarterbacks with throwing touchdowns, yeah. though. That would, that would be different. That would skew the numbers yeah. a little bit. So to, to see what he has done has, has been inc incredibly impressive in my mind. And I want to I point this out to you, Shane. The last four years, mm -hmm. Boise State has been an underdog. Excuse me, the last two years, Boise State has been an underdog four times. They've won three of those games outright. In those three games, Jonah Dalmas is 12 for 12 on field goal attempts, seven for seven on PATs. He's got four field goals of 40 yards or, or more, including the 51 yarder yeah. at Air Force. If you are an offensive player or heck, even a defensive player, how much all of a sudden does it make you respect your kicker because sometimes I mean come on like we can't lie here sometimes the kicker probably is an afterthought but in this case he's arguably like the offensive MVP at times so you just feel like how the Ravens feel they know that once they get across the 40 yeah Justin Tucker it's ball money. game yes it's ball game so ball game. you don't which is which allows you to be more conservative you don't have to take chances when you yep. know I just got to get to the 40 I don't even I get the ball back here in 35 we don't have far to go mm -mm. 25 yards we're in field goal range yep and it's automatic it's not no worries. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and this absolutely does affect the approach of an opposing offense and how they will, you know, go out and try to mm -hmm. execute in the red zone. And earlier this week, offensive coordinator Dirk Cutter uh, had this to say about it. I've definitely, as a play caller, been very conservative in the red zone. There's, there's no doubt about that. And uh, I'm going I'm to just go back to all the things I just talked about. We're trying to win games. And uh, you have less of your package in the red zone because of the, the field dimensions. Uh, obviously, some of that, some of your red zone plan each week is based on what the defense does. And so far, my experience with the teams we've played is they, bl they blitz a lot. You know, they blitz a lot in the red zone. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I feel like uh, I've definitely been, I've been too conservative as a play caller in the red zone. That, that has nothing to do with the players. But, again, we've been, other than the – now 12 quarters, 10 of those 12 quarters, we've been playing with the lead. So that, that plays into it as well. So if you look at, at the numbers, Boise State inside the red zone, is running it about 75% of the time since Dirk Cutter's been calling the shots. Yep. Now, now, that seems like a lot, but typically I would, you probably do run, the, run it in the red zone more than you would run it out near midfield, right? 
Yes, or maybe not. For sure. But I also think that what skew that is when you're at midfield, that's usually when you take shots. Right, okay. You know, you got your logo yeah, shots. Yeah, you're, you're you get getting down in the red zone. You, mm-hmm. you can't, I mean, there's just not enough room to take yeah. shots, right? Exactly. So you're forced, the, the field's condensed. It's easier for the defense to defend when you're in the red zone because they don't have a lot of ground to cover. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you typically get more runs. I, I love the transparency, the honesty of Dirk Cutter. It's so funny because um, you, we often deal with college coaches, and college coaches just have more coach speak, right? Mm-hmm. Guys with NFL experience, though, that have been there, they've done it. Uh, they work with paid professionals that this is their livelihood. For whatever reason, they're just a little bit more transparent and honest. And that's exactly the case that Dirk was this week. Having covered college for so long, I didn't expect him to come out and say, yeah, we've been very conservative in the red zone. I think I can be better. I just, I just wasn't expecting that. It's a lot easier to be honest and uh, very transparent when you know you're not coming back next eh, year. Maybe that's it, you're too. Not, you're not competing for a job. It's just, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm just here, you know, to get us through the season. I'm, I'm not going on recruiting trips. I'm hanging out at home. I'm on the golf course. Mm-hmm. It's a lot easier to be real transparent with oh, the university. Especially. Okay, so where do you, where do you want to see – or where do you think Boise State might might be less conservative or, or more aggressive, let's call it, in the red zone moving forward? And eventually we're going to push this into Taylor Green's development here. That's our next topic. So if the two, you know, correlate or whatever, you, you can go there if you want. But but how do you think that this, this, you know, progresses forward? I don't think you see them being less conservative until you get both backs mm-hmm. back. So I can see them putting both backs in the game and run, doing passing concepts with, you know, maybe it's only two men or three men routes and stuff out there, but I can see them, you know, when you have both those guys in the game, you're not going to see teams playing too high safety. <laughs> you're going to have extra guys right. in the box. So I can see them doing that. So when they get both of their guys healthy and back, I can see them starting to open it up a little bit more because now the threat of having both of those guys in the game is going to take a lot of pressure off Taylor. Now he doesn't have to make perfect throws. He has space because there's not a lot of people in coverage, but – if we are going into a game maybe with just one of those guys or maybe the one that is playing is not in, so you have a backup in, mm-hmm. yeah, it's going to be tough to kind of open it up for them. How do you create space in the red zone when space is at a premium? If Having you, two great backs helps <laughs> with that. I mean, it, it yeah. now, and now, it be, now it comes laterally instead of vertically on the yep. field, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's a lot easier in the red zone with two great backs that people have to respect than it is not having them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... I mean, on that note, I, we bring up the running backs now, and I, I did want to talk about this today. So we're going to talk about Taylor Green's development here in a second. But, you know, no, no George Halani last game. We talked about it on the pregame show prior to the game. We felt like he was either going to be highly limited or, or maybe out altogether. And he went through uh, warm-ups, never played a single snap at halftime, you know, put on a sweatsuit, and obviously his day was done. Ashton Gentry starts that game, his first collegiate start as a true freshman, 95 total yards, has the first quarter rushing touchdown. We don't see him in the second half. Um, he, too, is, is rocking a sweatsuit. So we don't know exactly what's wrong with either of them. In all honesty, we probably won't get any of that confirmed. Mm-hmm. It, it looked like Ashton, I mean – Sometimes when you're injured, you have some type of apparatus on yeah. you, right, or crutches yeah. or something, and, and he didn't have any of that. So I don't necessarily want to, like, guess or anything, but it is football and it is a contact sport, so assume what you will from that. Um, but how badly will this offense need one of those guys because they got shut out with either of them against Air Force, and Air Force has a decent defense. I mean, we put that up on the pregame show, too. They were allowing 183 yards per game going into that thing, which was yeah. ninth in all of college football. But how badly will these guys, will, will Boise State need either Holani or Genty, ideally both, but one of those guys moving forward? Uh, the engine does not run without the gas, mm. and they are definitely the gas. They're the gas. <laughs> so, uh, yes, Taylor, uh, his ability to run it obviously changes things for the offense, the mm-hmm. way the offense is ran, but it all starts with being able to run the ball, and you can't run the ball without the gas. Yeah, I, I think that we've seen Taylor make these strides because – so far, Boise State hasn't necessarily asked him to, like, put on the Superman cape. Like, he did it. He put it on himself there, the final play of the Air Force game to close that thing out and send that thing home. But um, he's had really good production from his running backs who have taken – he's taken a ton of pressure off his running backs 
because of, of, of his, his, you know, his threat with his speed yeah. on the outside. But in turn, their production has also taken, you know, put him in ideal situations so he doesn't have to play above and beyond himself. Boise State's had a great running game. They rushed for 300 yards against San Diego State, 300 yards against Fresno State, 115 on 40 carries against Air Force. So, man, they, they went out and they just, they freaking earned it, I guess, uh, against the Fa Falcons. You saw El Elian Noah. The Utah State transfer and Ezekiel Noah's little brother um, make a big impact in that game. Caden Dudley got a touch, but I mean, let's face it, that was that was pretty much it after Ashton Genty went out and Tyler Crow got a couple of touches too. But it, it just it looks very different um, in terms of in terms of the talent that they have once once Ashton and George aren't part of the equation. Because what makes them so great is they, they make things good when things are bad. They yep. fall forward. They they miss sure. they, you know they miss, they miss tackles and things like yeah. that. Yeah, it's a big difference. I mean, I don't think I've yet to see a play where Ashton Gentry has gotten tackled and and went backwards. Like mm -hmm. he's just always going forward. Always. So, yeah, it's 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 huge. Which is why you know we didn't move the ball as well in the second half because you don't have those guys who make the engine go. Uh, but like like we said, having Taylor's ability to you know pull the pull the ball that mm -hmm. changes a lot of things and that's how yeah. we were able to seal it. Yeah. Um, I want to draw your attention to a highlight uh, before we move on back to Taylor because on Ashton Genty's 42 yard reception out of the backfield on down the sideline man Steph Cobbs had an incredible effort on that play he, he was booking it downfield um, I can't remember what Matt Miller the wide receivers coach said they have some uh, I pick and stick or block for a buddy. I can't remember what it is. I know it's block for a buddy at the end of that thing. And man, did, did Steph get downfield in a hurry and help spring that run and make it such an explosive play. Um, so Taylor Green now making steps forward, passes for a career high 227 yards against Air Force. He throws the interception, but I mean, like that was just an outstanding play on a defense. I'm, I got a baseball background. Sometimes you throw your best pitch in an awesome location and the hitter hits it out. Yeah. Jordan Alvarez, I hate you. <laughs> um, but, it, it, but I mean, all serious, sometimes that just happens. There's nothing you can do, and just another guy's talent takes over. Uh, guy hit Steph Cobbs from behind, jarred the ball loose. It resulted in an interception, not on Taylor. And, heck, I don't even think that's on Steph for that matter either. But what did you see out of, out of his um, – the, the progress that he's making? Because, for me, I, I go back to the first game against Oregon State when he came in early as a reserve – uh, threw for 155, rushed for 102, I believe. Um, but after the game, we kind of heard like he would get through his progressions maybe quicker than he should have been getting through them, and he would take off at times. Mm -hmm. And now against Air Force, you see he only ran the ball a few times. He's 16 yeah. to 24 as a passer. It seems like he is being very deliberate in growing that part of his game. Yep, uh, the run game. It all goes back to the run game. Uh, we were running the ball down their throat in the first mm -hmm. half. Like, yeah. Practically couldn't be stopped. And so now you have this run game. Now he's able to throw. He has a little bit more time. They're focused on the run. If you're play actioning, I'm not really threatened by Taylor mm -hmm. through the air if I'm a defense. So I'm not really worried about the play action. Yeah. So now when he does get set up, now he has more time to go through his progression. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's just they're all feeding off of each other. So if I'm, the, if I'm Colorado State coming into this next game, I really want to know if they have these running backs. If they don't have these running backs, I'm going to send pressure and I'm yeah. going to make him make some decisions fast. Yeah. I mean, that, that is what, I mean, Air Force did try to do. Air Force is a team that, that knows to bring a lot of pressure. It is cool to see finally, though, the establishment of the run game, you know, and maybe that play action game does start to work a little bit because they are so committed to stopping mm -hmm. the run. And then you see Eric McAllister get a 44 yard reception. And even some of the running backs mentioned Ashton Genty had a 42 yard gain. I think, mm -hmm. Tyler Crow had, you know, had a big catch in that game as well where he got out to the, to the right. You know? So it, it's cool to see that kind of start to open things up. But um, one of those guys that was his go-to wide receiver in that game, Latrell Caples, uh, we asked Latrell what he thinks of Taylor, Taylor Green's development a little earlier this week as well. No, it's great to see that because uh, you want to see him grow as a passer. He's a young guy, so we all know he can run. He can, he can trick the defense out. But if he comes down with that passing thing, he's going to be a top guy in the country. So. Uh, he got time here, and he, got, he just can keep growing throughout the year, and that's what he's doing. Since San Diego State, I mean, obviously, the secret's out that Taylor's a pretty good runner and pretty fast, so teams have, have changed the way they're playing our, our read game, and they're doing more to box him in. And so we would like, we would like Taylor to carry the ball more than he did. We had multiple reads called in the game, 
And if you were really watching that game, they, they blitzed us a lot in that game. They, they blitzed us off the edges a lot. They blitzed us on the inside a lot. So every blitz package they have changes the way their, their uh, contained players are playing on the perimeter. And that changes the read for Taylor based on are they squeezing, are they rushing up the field. And, you know, for the most part, they were, they were trying to make him give the ball. And, but we'd like him to run a little bit more. So, Shane, you can hear, like, these guys are confident in Taylor, and I, and I feel like they've been confident in Taylor for a while now. Yep. But when you make that switch in season, right, like, this has a new rhythm, a new feeling when a guy, when there's another guy running the offense, right? Uh-huh. How does a, how does a second string quarterback turn starter endear himself to the rest of the offense, earn their trust? All of that. Is it just a matter of time when you're young? Is it production? Is it, hey, man, you know, is Taylor showing up a little bit earlier for film? Like, mm-hmm. how, how does, how does a, a new quarterback earn that midseason? I feel like when you are in this, and if you're in this program and you see Taylor, first of all, you see exactly what everyone else see. I've, I actually told someone a few weeks ago that it's just, Taylor's from Texas, I'm from Texas, you know, growing up. I watched Texas growing up. My dad played at Texas. So yeah. I am, I've always said that he gives me Vince Young type mm-hmm. vibes with the way he runs. He just, it's not, you know, a lot of frequency. Their stride length is what he, he covers a lot of ground. And when I watched the game this week, that's exactly what they did. They posted it. They uh, posted him next mm-hmm. to Vince Young, all the attributes and stuff. And he resembles exactly how he runs, his size. And so... When you see Taylor, the eye test tells you, okay, that's a that's an that's an athlete. Yeah. And then you get he comes in the game and you start seeing production. So now it's like, okay, I know he doesn't have much experience, but I know what he could be. You know, he's from Texas. He grew up probably watching the same stuff. So you could have yeah. a Vince Young back there, but you don't know yet. And when he gets in the game, he gives you that kind of success. So as a as a teammate you probably feel really good about this guy going forward and just where he will be, you know, year two, year three, and year four mm-hmm. versus, uh, you know, if he, was, if he didn't look the way he does. Right. And, and I do think, like, Boise State getting leads and stuff, gosh, it, it has been so critical for, for Taylor Green, his development, the success of the offense, because as we talked about a little bit earlier in the red zone, the space gets a little tighter. You don't feel like you have to put the ball in harm's way mm-hmm. or maybe do something that makes your offense – a little uncomfortable, or your quarterback a little uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, they've managed it to this point. And one, thing, one other thing I want to bring up about Dirk Cutter is, like, you know, he spent most of the last 14, 15 years in the NFL. Mm-hmm. How many blowouts do you see in the NFL? Not a lot. Not a lot. Like, so when we talk about managing games to win games, I mean, that's, that's something that he knows. Yeah. It's his background, and he's done a very – I feel stupid for even saying this, but, like, because it's obvious, but he's done a really good job at it so far. Yeah, it's experience. He's, he's like you said, he's been through it many a time. Yeah. Uh, for his, you know, for his freshman quarterback, being able to not have to rely on your arm to make the big play and being able to use your legs mm-hmm. makes things a bit easier for you because throwing the ball has so many components in it. You know, you get the snap. Not only does the line have to be able to pass block and not let those guys get to you, to avoid, so you have to avoid and throw on the run and these kind of things, but now you also have to have the receiver create separation. Mm-hmm. Now you need the receiver to actually catch the ball. You know, all these things that go into it, running the ball, it just comes down literally to Hand the O-line thing, getting that block. <laughs> the O-line just making their blocks, yeah. and it's you against that guy. Yeah. I don't have to worry about now I have to make a good throw. Now this guy has to create separation, so I can make the throw. Now this guy has to catch the ball. Like, all these other factors, it's really easy to make plays when things are simplified. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think that when I look back and I think of Taylor Green's defining moments of the season, like that touchdown run at the end of the, end of the San Diego State game that put, like, if it wasn't the nail in the coffin, it might, it might have been, like, another nail in the coffin <laughs> at that point. But for me, that, that first down run that he had against Air Force, they had a terrible negative play early in that drive. Yeah. And it looked like, oh, man, they're going to give the ball back to Air Force. And then all of a sudden, your six foot six gazelle uh, just Ooh. says, you know what? I haven't ran the ball a lot tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to go win us a game right here. He finds space, and that thing was over. That, that yeah. was awesome. I, I forgot when I was talking about the defense, I wanted to bring up this, this one fun story. And then we're going to move on to Colorado State real quick, quick before we wrap this thing up. Um, 
we were in the, the press box, and for whatever reason, man, the Air Force puts the assistant coaches, the coordinators, in the room right next to us, and I swear the, the wall must have been made of paper <laughs> because we could hear a lot what was going on inside there. But you, you go back to the end of that game, and um, Boise State gets flagged for having two number sevens on the field, uh -huh. which I thought was funny. Did that ever happen in your time? I've never seen that happen. Okay. No. I, I think this is funny, and I would love to know a little bit more about that play. Andy said that it's his fault. Zeke said they practiced it that way all week. It was their mistake. But what I want to know, they ran that play multiple times throughout the game. Why at that point in time was it actually flagged? And I'm thinking, and maybe I'm giving like a guy like Troy Calhoun too much credit, if it's fourth and 10 and you notice they got two guys on the field, mm -hmm. you don't call your attention at that point in time because it's only a five-yard penalty. Mm -hmm. So in that specific play, it was fourth and five. He lets him punt the ball. Hey, they had two sevens on the yep. field. They've done it multiple times. I wonder if that's what happened. I think that happened or he alerted them. Yeah. Before, because this has happened already, and then now they see yeah. it. Yeah. But like I said, you only take advantage of that uh -huh. if it's fourth and five or less. And they yeah. found that position where it resulted in a first down. Yep. So that, ex that, that gives Air Force new life. Mm -hmm. They get another set of downs. They go down, they try to win this thing. So another fourth down play, and you hear Spencer Danielson in the press box. Zeke, drop back. <laughs> Zeke, drop back. <laughs> Talking about a star linebacker, right? Whatever look Air Force was giving him, he wanted Zeke further from the line of scrimmage. Yep. And Zeke didn't necessarily drop back, but he also goes out and he makes the game-winning play, gets to the yep. deflection. And so Danielson was saying earlier this week, this team is not perfect. This defense is not perfect. Mm -hmm. But, man, do they play hard, and they make up for a lot of things with, with their effort. And it's, yes. been, it's just been cool to see. So now, Colorado State rolls into the blue. The Rams have absolutely struggled this year. This is Boise State's opportunity to show how dominant they can be against another Mountain West opponent. Yeah. A chance for the Broncos to move to 5-0 and against the Colorado State team that really, really struggles to score and move the football on offense. I think Boise State's got a great chance to go out there, fly around, yeah. and make it a long day on the blue for Colorado State. Yeah, I think... I think I see Colorado State scoring 10 points. And that's what the line would suggest right now. Like, yeah. Boise State favored by 25. The over-under I think I saw was like 46 or something like that. So they're kind of throwing out like a 35-10 score. Yeah. I'm not going to lie, Shane. I'll take the under. I mean, I, I know there might be some areas where Boise State's a little banged up right mm -hmm. now, and we'll kind of wait for all that to play out. Yeah. But um, I, I think that it, with what I've seen out of this Boise State defense – I just, I'm not giving Colorado State much credit. I'm just, I'm not. Like, if, yeah. if Boise State can score 20, I think they win it by double digits at least. I, I, think, that, I think that Colorado State has, has a really difficult time getting the double digits on the scoreboard. I see Colorado State scoring uh, either a field goal or a touchdown early in the game. Okay. You know, we get a little rattled. You know how they do. And then we finally <laughs> get it going. Eh, it's kind of been and, a theme on the blue so far this yeah. year. Like, the They'll first half, something. yeah, it mm -hmm. takes Boise State a little while to get going, and go the second in, half it just lights out. You're going to halftime 7, uh, let's go 7, 17, 7, 24. Okay. And then we come out and we, we erupt a little bit more. We extend the lead, but I think at the end of the game, when we start taking some guys out, mm -hmm. they might get a drive where they might get some more points. Yeah. That's where the 10 will and, that, and I will say, and, that, and this is definitely the point in time of the season where if you can start to use your depth mm -hmm. because you're up by a little bit, you use your yeah. depth because you want to save the wear and tear on your starters, especially before you go into BYU week. Mm -hmm. And then in November that – they're going to try to make memorable and chase down a Mountain West title. Uh, does Bronco Nation make a difference? Some tough stats before we get you out of here. When Boise State plays at home, this is their FBS ranks in home games. They've only allowed 166.3 yards per game at home this season, fewest in the country. They're only allowing 3.12 yards per play uh, at home this season, fewest in the country. Do the math, times that by three, that doesn't result in a first down. Why they're so good at getting off the field. Um, they've only allowed 293 passing yards on the blue this season. That's it. That's not one game. That's it in all of them combined. Yeah. And then finally, rushing yards allowed per game at home. Uh, 
68.7, fifth fewest in the country. They have been so good at home, uh, undefeated so far, which is so encouraging because last year, Boise State struggled a little bit on the blue. I will offer this as one reminder. One of the coaches that came to Boise State in conference play and beat them, Jay Norvell, who is now at Colorado State after jumping ship at Nevada last year. So if you're looking for motivation, there's some absolute motivation um, that's kind of an underlying theme or, or uh, storyline in this specific matchup. You got, you, you got your final prediction, Shane, before we get out of here? Yeah, outside of my eight, eight I said when Taylor took over, we will win eight games. Yeah. Okay. Looking like I'm going to be right. Yeah, okay. I'd say we win at least eight. I think we're on track to win ten, nine or ten now, but uh, I feel like at that point people were still doubting and saying that, you know, just because we got a new quarterback and a new OC, things wouldn't pan out. But uh, it's good to see that I was right. I love being right. <laughs> uh, for this one, I'm going to go, are we going 20, is 26 and a half the spread? I th yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what, it opened as Boise State by 25, 25, over under 46. Oh, if that's the case, I take Boise State on the spread, and the over under is 46, I yep. take the under. Oh, okay, I'm, I would take the under too. Um, I'm going to go 33-7. I was going to go 30 to 10. Okay. 40. 30 to 10. Bronco Roundup Game Day Show live on the blue from 4 to 5 o'clock. Kickoff is at 5 o'clock. Boise State taking on Colorado State. The Broncos trying to push their winning streak to four straight games. We'll see if they can get it done. For Shane Williams Rhodes, I'm Jay Tuss. This is Jay Sports Bar serving the Idaho sports community. Uh, we finished this one up with a fun little story about Matt Miller and his wife, Sarah, who recently became parents. October 3rd. At 1.24 in the morning, it was pretty, it was pretty cool, pretty cool moment. We welcomed Charlie Ann to the world and healthy baby, healthy mom. The baby was born Monday. I was, I was back in the office uh, Tuesday morning for practice. You know, that's just the life of a football coach. Luckily, Charlie's a great sleeper. And so um, obviously she has her moments where she wants to, to stay up and hang out with mom and dad, but uh, knock on wood, she's been doing a really good job. And I'm excited to get home and, and see him and spend time with him and, and take every second I can and cherish those moments. It's just one of those things I talk to the guys about it. You know, you wake up one day and your purpose is set a little bit differently. And that day when that happened, my purpose changed drastically to something different. It's a very cool moment for me. It's a very cool moment for my wife and I to share and uh, very excited about just being a father and being able to have that purpose every single day where the most important thing in my, in my life is my family. And now I have a daughter to raise and I'm really excited about that opportunity and that's been a true blessing.